Hello, everybody. I am Faiza Shelugi, moderator of this session. I am a member of ICMAI, country representative of Tunisia, uh, and I am a member of the panel for section 19, Mathematical Education and Popularization of Mathematics. This section aims to present key issues and research in mathematics education and new development in the popularization of mathematics. In this session, we are pleased to welcome Anna Sfard from Faculty of Education from University of Haifa. Professor Anna does research on learning with particular focus on the relation between thinking and communication. Her studies per pertain to mathematics education. Professor Anna will present to us the long way from mathematics to mathematics education, how educational research may change one's vision of mathematics and of its learning and teaching. I would like to give the floor now to Professor Anna. Thank you very much. Thank you. We are waiting. Hello to all of you, wherever you are. It would be lovely to be with you now in St. Petersburg and to interact in three dimensions. This being impossible, let us make the best of the two-dimensional encounter. To breathe life into it, let me begin with a declaration that may give you a pause. My central task in this talk will be to define mathematics. Define it mathematics, you may wonder. Why? After all you can say about mathematics, what the well-known mathematician Mark Katz, one of the founding fathers of spectral theory, said about his wife. I cannot define this creature, but I recognize it when I see it. And my cuts might have added, can we simply just do mathematics, learn it, teach it? His answer would likely be, yes, we can. Indeed, mathematicians to do mathematics do not need to bother themselves with the question of what mathematics is anymore than you to eat your breakfast need to answer the question of what nutrition is. Yes, all this may be true of mathematicians, but I am not a practicing mathematician. I am mathematics educator and, as I am sure you will gladly agree, this is not the same. And what is the difference? While looking for an answer, I run an internet search. Among others, I Google up images for the term mathematician and also then for mathematics teacher. And here is what I got for this first group. See, these are the mathematicians. And here for the second, these are, according to internet, mathematics teachers. As you can see, all the images are surprisingly similar. In each of them, we see a person standing in front of a board co covered with mathematical symbols. At a closer look, however, there is a difference between the two groups and it is difficult to miss. Can you tell? Well, all the mathematicians are pictured here as looking at the board with their backs, backs to us. In contrast, all the teachers are facing us and are only pointing to the board. This one difference, I think, tells volumes. It conveys to us that as a mathematician, you spend your time within the mathematical universe uniquely concerned with its objects whereas as mathematics educator you care you care in addition perhaps mainly about the young people who try to enter that universe this disparity makes a world of difference into what in what and how you are doing thus if one asks whether we can teach mathematics without asking what exactly mathematics is? The answer is resounding, no, we can't. And the reason is simple. How you teach depends on how you think about it, what you are teaching and how it may be learned. And now, hoping that I did manage to convince you about the significance of the task of defining mathematics, let me give it a try. One simple way to define mathematics is to say that, just like the biology is a study of living things, 
such as plants or animals. And as physics is a study of material things, moving bodies, light, etc., so is mathematics a study of mathematical objects. This may sound good, except for one thing. While we all have a good idea of what a living thing is or mathematical object is, we are much less certain when it comes to mathematical objects. So this definition is incomplete without explaining what we mean by this term, mathematical objects. But should we really deal with this question? As we know only too well from history, asking it is likely to result in consternation and embarrassment. And indeed, research mathematicians remain mostly silent on this issue. This is what I'm reading, for example, from these words uttered tongue in cheek by the philosopher Bertrand Russell. Mathematics can be described as a subject in which we never know what we are talking about, nor whether what we are saying is true. In other words, just like a juggler keeps balls, bats, and knives in the air without bothering about who made them and how they did it, so does the explorer of mathematical universe juggle numbers, triangles, and sets, happy to have them in her world and without asking what brought them there or how and by whom they were made. In consequence, the issue of the origins and nature of mathematical objects remains an elephant in the classroom. Indeed, how can you teach without being able to tell yourself and your students what it is that you are teaching about? In short, those who are concerned with the teaching of mathematics cannot allow themselves the luxury of not giving a clear answer to the question, what are mathematical objects and where do they come from? This question along with the initial one, um, what is mathematics, are the theme of this talk. The answer I am going to present may appear to you somewhat unusual, but may I ask you to suspend your disbelief. In the end, I will show that this approach is likely to make a beneficial difference to our understanding of learning and in result also to the teaching of mathematics. Okay, let me begin from the beginning. So what are mathematical objects? Most people would probably give the straightforward, straightforward answer. All these numbers, functions, sets, geometric figures, and so on, are simply the symbols we write or the shapes we draw while talking about them. But if this was so, why would we write things like this? Why would we ever put equal sign between such two very differently looking mathematical symbolic expressions? What would be the same for the two sides of the equation? Obviously, not the expressions as such. We used to justify this equality differently. We do this by claiming that the numbers you get from these two expressions for a specific value of x are equal, or alternatively, that the two expressions represent the same function. And whereas expressions are signs, that is, symbolic structures, numbers and functions are precisely these entities that we call mathematical objects. All this reflects the classical take on the quandary of mathematical objects, which most of us seem to tacitly endorse. Eponymously called platonic, this vision, the one we signal when speaking in terms of objects and their representations, is grounded in the assumption that mathematical objects, just like their physical counterparts, such as rocks or animals, are entities that exist in the world independently of human mind. Here, mathematical signs are material avatars of independently existing ideal things. Because of this object avatar, avatar dichotomy, the platonic view is also known as dualist. Most of us are crypto platonists. We expose the platonic view unknowingly, simply by joining the dualist discourse of signs as representations, by saying things like the fractions 
1 over 2, 4 over 8, and oh, 0 0.5 represent the same rational number. Or when claiming in general that signs are mere representations of mathematical objects. Some mathematicians endorse this dualist view explicitly. For instance, René Tom, known as an inventor of catastrophe theory, famously said, everything considered mathematicians should have courage of their most profound convictions and thus affirm that mathematic, mathematical forms indeed have an existence that is independent of the mind considering them. Well, as an educator, I cannot be satisfied with the dualist approach. Mathematical objects as intangible, objectively existing entities? How can I or my students get handled of these ambiguous, invisible things? My colleagues and I spent years searching for a way to bypass this quandary, and we did it by trying to revise the dualist vision. I will now offer a resulting non dualist take on the issue of mathematical objects, hoping that you will find it as convincing, operational, and eye-opening as it has been for us. Before I present this non-dualist vision, let me engage you in an exercise. I claim that these four pictures here, as different as they are, present the same person. What is it, in your opinion, that may justify this claim. This claim. Well, it is probably the fact that what we have here are images of one person that were simply taken, these pictures were taken at different times during his life. You may even recognize the person. Can you? Right, it is Sigmund Freud. Now, let me switch to the following six pictures. One, two, three, four, five, six. Can we speak in terms of a single thing represented in different ways also here? It seems we can. We can say that all these pictures represent the same mathematical object, number five. As an aside, only in mathematics can situations as different as this be considered as representing the same object. This is probably why Henri Poincaré, possibly the best known French mathematician, famously said that mathematics is the art of giving the same name to different things. Back to our example, where is this number five? The only perceptual accessible common feature of these six things may be described as follows. For each of them, if we count its elements, we end up with the word five. If so, this is probably the same process, the process of counting that ends with the word five rather than the same object that is, that is implicated in all these pictures. It is this process that accounts for our talk about all these cases as, in a sense, the same. The conclusion from all this is simple. Number is but a metaphor. We speak about mathematical processes as if they were objects. Because we create this impression uh, of object by borrowing grammatical forms that are used in the case of objects. The metaphor we use is thus of special kind. We can call it objectification of the process of counting. And the effect of objectification is that we use the number, uh, number signs, number words, numerals, as if they signified objects existing in the world independently of us. Only after we adopt this objectified form of speech that we begin saying that the number words and numerals represent objects called numbers. To summarize, the new non-dualist take on the question of what mathematical objects are can be formulated like this. Mathematical objects are discursive constructs. They arise through and for the sake of communication. As such, this approach 
can be called discursive. The word cognition, the portmanteau of communication and cognition, is also used in this context. The reason for combining communication with cognition will become clear in a moment. The discursive nature of at least some mathematical objects has been already inti intimated by one of the greatest mathematicians of all times, Carl Friedrich Gauss, who famously stated that infinity is merely a façon de parler, a manner of speech. From a statement about particular mathematical object, the infinity, this claim can now uh, has now been extended to all of the abstract mathematic, mathematical entities. But here a question arises. If objectified talk is just an alternative to talking in terms of processes, why should we ever convert to speaking in terms of objects? What is the advantage of talking in terms of objects rather than processes? What are those objects good for? Well, for one thing, objectification makes our life easier. The mathematician William Thurston recalls an experience that was clearly related to the event of objectification. I remember as a child, he said, in fifth grade, coming to the amazing to me realization that the answer to 134 divided by 29 is 134 over 29. What a tremendous labor saving device. To me, 134 divided by 29 meant a certain tedious chore, while 134 over 29 was an object with no implicit work. Back to our question, this quantum drop in the degree of difficulty is related to the all-important fact that objectification makes communication thriftier and incomparably more efficient. Indeed, once we objectify, we can say much more with much less. To make this point, let me take a look at this symbolically presented mathematical narrative. I can read it in words as follows. If I extract a square root from x and raise the result to the third power, I get the same result as when I raise x to the third power and extract square root from it. But I can also read it in this way. The third power of square root equals square root of the third power. What is the difference between these two formulations? One dissimilarity literally jumps to I. The statement on the right is much shorter more concise than the one on the left. But there is another, less conspicuous difference. To help you, I colored the keywords of both utterances in red. You now certainly realize that the expression on the left is mainly about human operations. I extract, I rise, and so on. Whereas the one on the right is about objects, third power, square root, etc. Thus, this one is objectified, where this one isn't. This example clearly corroborates my point. Objectification allowed us to say what we wanted to say more briefly. I will now take advantage of this example to make you aware of two discursive transformations with the help of which objectification attains its effect, creates the impression of independently existing objects. First, there is reification, that is, substitution of verb clauses with noun clauses. Thus, I rise to the third power on the left side is replaced with the simple third power on the right. Second, there is alienation, that is, removal of the human subject. This is what happens in this example when I simply delete the words, I rise. And one final remark. The importance of thus attain verbal thriftiness goes well beyond the fact that it prevents wasting words. Thanks to its condensing effort, uh, effect, objectification is what makes it possible to extend mathematics in practically boundless manner.
this discursive take on the quandary of mathematical objects is described as non-dualist or monist because it removes the ontological dichotomy of science versus mathematical objects. The defining tenet of this approach may be formulated as follows. Whereas material objects around us exist independently of communication about them, mathematical objects exist only in the scarcely created universe and are constituted by science. Having clarified the nature and origins of mathematical objects, I can now return to my main query of what is mathematics? I have already defined mathematics as a study of mathematical objects. Within the question of the nature and origins of mathematical objects answer, answered, we might think that the definition is complete. Not quite so, though. There is still a term here that requires clarification. Indeed, what does it mean to study objects, mathematical or otherwise? My answer to this question is this. To study a certain type of objects is to tell potentially useful, we call them true as well, useful or true stories about them. To study a certain type of objects is to tell potentially useful stories about them. You may shrug at this definition. Such serious activity as studying or investigating equated with such often frivolous activity as storytelling. But take a close look at these three examples of outcomes of scientific studies, one from physics, one from research on learning, and one from mathematics. Aren't they all stories? Even the one in physics, as unlikely as it may seem as an example of a story, does turn into a narrative once we write it in words rather than symbols. The distance traveled by a free falling object is equal to half of its constant acceleration multiplied by the square of the time of the travel. Of course, these three propositions are just tips of icebergs, the rest of which can be found in academic journals and books. Still, these are stories, if only in nutshells. I hope I have convinced you, and if so, here is my definition of story, of story. The term story of X, where X is a noun, is used as referring to a consistent, cohesive sequence of utterances that, when taken together, can be said to be about X or on X or of X. The aboutness means that X is a grammatical object or subject of some of the utterances in the sequence. The term consistent says that there are that, that no contradictions, no logical conflict may result from this set of utterances. This term cohesive indicates the presence of lexical grammatical links that hold this sequence together. The links may be chronological, as is the case when the successive utterances are connected by words such as before, after, or next. It can be logical, attained by the use of connectors such as therefore, it follows, and, or. And it can be causal, expressing itself in the presence of words such as because. Okay, so we do have an operational definition of the term story, and I hope you can now live with its being a part of the definition of mathematics. One last thing, though, that still requires clarification is what is meant in this context by the word useful, which, in relation to mathematics, is often replaced with the adjective true, and the story itself is said to be endorsed. To explain, I need to say a few words about the role that stories fulfill in our lives. Since Aristo, humans have been said to be born storytellers. Our propensity for stories has good reasons. Except for storytelling being our favorite pastime, stories fulfill, fulfill two central, important, indeed indispensable roles in our lives. First, they are our best tool for sense making. 
indeed to make sense of something means combining all you know about the something into a single story, into a sequence of utterances that are co consistent and cohesive, exactly as stated in our definition of stories. Second, stories are a tool for deciding about how to act. You mediate your actions by stories about the objects you manipulate, whether these objects are material or just discursive. This is what you do, for instance, when during shopping for lunch, you make your choices on the basis of what you know about the kinds of foods that are good for you. Stories about geometrical shapes you learned in school can mediate your planning of a new house. Finally, what you know, know about numbers impacts the way you manipulate algebraic expressions. Scientific and mathematical stories are told precisely for these two purposes for making sense of our experience and for being for helping with our practical decisions. Thus, you see a story as useful <clears throat> if it fulfills these two functions to your satisfaction. True, some people mediate their actions with theories that may not count as scientific in everybody's eyes, as is the case when they try to protect themselves against an illness with magic and charm rather than vaccines. This only shows that the quality of of usefulness is a complex matter and depends on storytellers' tastes and choices. But whatever your expectations with regard to usefulness, it is now clear that if the stories you endorse are to fulfill their mission, they must be told in special ways with appropriate tools. These tools come in the form of designated discourses. By the term discourse, I mean a particular form of communication. This discourse may be described as a communicational game that defines a community. Community of a given discourse consists of people who are able to participate in this discourse. This is exactly how it is with games. The community of, say, chess consists of people who are able to play chess. It is important to remember that discourses may be in words, but more often than not, discourse is multimodal. Sometimes it takes place in just body movement, gestures, facial expressions, pictures, any of these, all, all of them together. Discourse can be pra practiced with others or with oneself. In this later case, the discursive activity is called thinking. Each one of us belongs to many partially overlapping discourse communities. To summarize, the discursive definition of mathematics may now be presented visually as follows. Mathematics is a discourse in which one creates potentially useful stories on mathematical objects. The objects may be functions, sets, geometric figures, whatever, count, whatever counts as mathematical. The stories about these objects as a part, are a part of the discourse and, when taken together, constitute a discursive entity that we call theory, theory of a given type of object. Having introduced you to the discursive definition of mathematics, I have one remaining task to perform. I have to convince you that doing the definitely uneasy work of changing your way of thinking about mathematics from dualist to monist will eventually have significant payoffs. Whereas some of you may think that your mathematical research will remain unaffected, I am now about to show that the suggested conversion may be highly beneficial to, to those whose job it is to teach mathematics. I will do this by demonstrating that transition to the discursive approach may usefully deepen our understanding of learning mathematics. Out of numerous game-changing insights about the learning of mathematics that come with the new vision, I will present a single most basic one. I will then argue that its practical implications with regard to teaching go against some nowadays widely professed pedagogical principles. When mathematics is seen as storytelling activity, learning mathematics becomes developing a particular discourse recognizable as mathematical. 
An important part of such development is an occasional addition of new mathematical objects. It is therefore useful to distinguish here between two types of discursive changes that must happen in the course every so often, in the course of learning mathematics. First, the learner may be required to get better acquainted with the objects of which she's already aware. This type of development will express itself in an addition of new endorsed narratives on these objects, that is, in the expansion of the theory of these objects. This is, for instance, what happens when negative integers have already been introduced and the learner, who is already reasonably proficient in manipulating them, has to get acquainted as, as well as she can with their properties. Quite a different type of development happens when a new kind of mathematical object is being introduced. Unlike the former kind of change, this time the rules of the game may change as well. Indeed, this kind of development usually comes with changes in the use of some words and with alterations of some of the rules that govern this discourse. Think, for instance, about what happened in history and nowadays takes place tacitly in class in the classroom with the first appearance of negative numbers. At this point, the use of the word number change, changes rather drastically and the new discourse, which is now the discourse of signed numbers, has rules of endorsement quite different from those that were in operation till now. I do not have the time to go into details here, but I hope you can see how wide this discursive change is. These two types of necessary developments will be called respectively object level and meta level. Of course, because there are two levels of discourse development, there are also two levels of learning. As an educator, I feel compelled to ask how these two levels of learning may actually occur. I will be asking preliminarily if there is any difference in how the object level and meta level learning may happen and in the conditions these two types of learning require. At the object level, where learning preserve, uh, preserve, preserves the current discourse and is supposed to just extend an existing theory, the student may, at least in principle, learn on her own. Indeed, since the expected change in discourse is a matter of just logical necessity and thus of pure deduction, learning can be attained by reinvention, kind of. When, in contrast, a meta-level development must occur, reinvention, although theoretically possible, is highly unlikely. After all, the historical change that led to this new discourse was a, it was a matter of contingency, not of necessity. To say it differently, mathematical objects and meta-rules of mathematics are historically established conventions. Conventions that have good reasons, but still conventions. Rather than being necessitated by rules of logic, they result from the fact that, for one reason or another, mathematicians opted for a particular reasonable possibility out of men. But this means that when you are expected to make a transition to a new discourse about a new kind of mathematical object, you face a paradoxical situation. As I argued before, mathematical objects, unlike rocks and animals, do not wait for us out there to be manipulated and investigated. They are made on the go. They come into being as we tell stories about them. This may sound as unlikely as the claim that an aircraft may be constructed while airborne, with the constructor already sitting in it and flying. Indeed, to construct a new object, the learner has to participate in the discourse about it. But in order to participate in this discourse, she has to have already constructed the new object. She is entangled here in a veritable vicious circle 
And it may be one of the principal reasons why she may fail in her attempts to get access to the target discourse. And since school curriculum is replete with the need for, for such transitions, and since these transitions are mostly invisible to the teacher, it may be unsurprising that so many students drop out of the participation in mathematics somewhere along the way. Moreover, the mathematics teacher who could have helped them is frequently unaware that the mathematical object, objects he is juggling in front of his class are not yet accessible to the students. In this situation, what the students see is an empty handed person making strange, incomprehensible movements. From where the learners are, it may appear as a true madness with no method in it. So how to overcome the circularity? Well, it took me and my colleagues years of research and development to work out our response. In the short time I have left, I cannot possibly do justice to what we proposed. I will nevertheless present it here in a nutshell, hoping you will see this brief exposure as but a trailer that promises an exciting classroom drama. Okay, so the immediate conclusion from what has been said about meta-level learning is that the student should not be expected to come across a historically established idea of a new mathematical object on her own or entirely on her own. She needs to be exposed to this idea by others. She must be able to observe those who are already well-versed in the historically developed discourse featuring this object. Initially, because of the vicious circle of objectification, she cannot possibly participate in this discourse in a meaningful way. But she must try, and this means imitating what the experts are doing, if only to be able to zoom into these operations and to reflect on the participants' reasons for perform performing them, for acting the way they do. We call this type of learning reflective imitation. After a period of reflective imitation, the student, if successful, will arrive at a good sense of the new object and of its being an inextricable part of the rest of mathematical universe. If you are like me, mathematics educator, you could not fail to notice that this advice goes against the nowadays popular principle of teaching by helping students to reinvent most of mathematical discourse. Called constructivist, this principle is often justified by the teachings of two arguably most influential theoreticians of learning, Jean Piaget and Lev Vygotsky. But if so many people actually believe in the possibility that almost all mathematical learning can happen by reinvention, this is mainly because of their obliviousness to the unique nature of, of meta-level learning. Most of us may even be unaware of its very existence. This in spite of the fact that school and university curricula are replete with junctures at which meta-level learning must happen. These critical points tend indeed to remain invisible to the teacher, even to the teacher. And the reason is simple. Once meta-level learning has occurred and we feel comfortable in a new discourse, the pains of the transition, unlike those of birth giving, are quickly forgotten. I hope that this one weighty conclusion from the discursive definition of mathematics is enough to convince you about the worthiness of the seemingly unlikely task in which I engaged you in this talk, the task of trying to answer the question of what mathematics is, where it comes from, and how it develops. For those of you who are left with a taste for more and would like to get more familiar with the discursive vision of mathematics, let me suggest this book, or alternatively, perhaps in addition, this site, which is a part of International Mathematical Union website. So thank you and see you there. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you, Anna, for your great and excellent and original presentation. Uh, and now I will uh, thank all everybody, all participants for your uh, uh, assistance and uh, participation. Uh, I don't know if, uh, if Anna, there is still a few times to, if you would like to add uh, a few words. Uh, the first uh, addition is something technical because there's no really a possibility to have a conversation right now. I don't know whether there are any questions, comments, remarks, and so on. The only thing I can uh, suggest is that whoever is interested in really having some exchange with me on this topic, I am always available through email. So just don't hesitate and I will be happy to get your whatever it is, question, critique, disagreement, everything. So this is one thing to say. Another thing to say is that I tried very hard really to uh, give a talk, which is the length appropriate for the length of the session. So I don't, I have too many things to add now <laughs> to even start. So I don't know, there's no possibility of any question right now, okay. I understand. So I am afraid that we just need to finish now. Thank <laughs> okay. you. Okay, thank you, thank you, Anna, and uh, many thanks to everybody for your attention. And uh, I will thank do. You.